Fargo Rate democratizes pool by putting all players on the same universal scale, regardless of sex or age or geography. We've not yet weighed in on reasons for performance differences between men and women at pool. And I'll start by flipping this book to the last page. We find no evidence for a biological difference between men and women at pool. Everyone pretty much agrees that more men than women play pool and more of the top pool players are men. But what about this one? Men and women are built differently in ways that impact performance at many physical activities. If you don't already agree with this, you will in a minute. Forget those though. Most of you also buy this one. Men beat women at pool because they're built differently. You really don't know. You think you know, but you don't know. Again, most people think it's a no-brainer that biological differences explain performance differences between men and women at pool. And we're here to tell you it's complicated. You think you know, but you don't know. For many simple physical activities like throwing, jumping, running, the best in even a small country outperformed the world's best women. An example is the country of Iceland, shown here in relation to the rest of Europe. Its 350,000 people can fit into four Wembley stadiums, about like the city of Wichita, Kansas, or Cleveland, Ohio. The Icelandic record beats the women's world record at runs of all of these different lengths and jumps and throws. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to recent BCA Hall of Fame inductee Kelly Fisher. Here she is being interviewed by my friend Joey Ryan, and we'll tap into this in a bit. Kelly's a good pool player. In fact, near as we can tell, she beats every woman in North America, every woman in South America, Europe, Africa, Oceania, and Antarctica. That's pretty good. How would she do against all pool players in Iceland? If this was running or jumping or throwing, this world-class woman would not beat all competitors in Iceland. But it's pool, and Kelly Fisher beats all pool players in Iceland. So already pools looking different than running, jumping, and swimming, but just how different may surprise you. Turns out Kelly's a favorite against all players, also in Ireland, Belgium, Italy, Montenegro, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Bulgaria, Moldova, Ukraine, Belarus, and Latvia, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Slovakia, Czechia, and Turkey. We can play the same game in North America. Kelly beats all players in, well, you get the idea. So let's pop in and see what Joey Ryan has to say in his really excellent pool player podcast. I have a hard time understanding why men at the top levels outperform women, you know, because it's not a sport where, you know, physical strength is involved. If you look at the top, like, 15 players uh, in terms of Fargo rate, female players, you're number seven, and everybody else in the top 15 is from Asia, right? And you guys are really closing the gap on the men, right? So Siming Chen's close to 800, you know, and Shane Van Boning's like 820-sums. Here's Fargo ratings being introduced to the intellectual dark web. Ah, Fargo ratings, popularity ratings for the world. 213,000 players, 16 million games. I bet this guy would find this bit of trivia interesting. Kelly Fisher, who beats all women in pool in all continents other than Asia, and Chen Siming, who beats all women in all continents at pool, both have black belts in martial arts. Now, that's a pretty cool mention. I hear Mr. Rogan's getting pretty influential these days, but I have to say it's the second coolest unsolicited mention this week. Jin here just turned 11. This is Jin. Um, thank you for creating the Fargo rate system, and... I hope it continues to grow along with my Fargo. Let's frame this discussion by talking about what I call attributes. Think of these as raw material skills or capabilities that lead to success at various competitive activities. Running, jumping, and throwing tend to involve just one or two of these for which there's a well-known biological difference between men and women. If you take a fast woman, she'll be faster than most men and maybe much faster than most men. But if you take a large population, say 100 million people, and look at the 10 fastest people, you're not going to find any women because you're really sampling the far reaches of the distribution of speed. So even if there's only a small difference between men and women, you're going to see it for sure here. Tennis and golf are more complex, and though several other attributes contribute, speed and strength are still in the mix. As an aside, the most impactful thing that's happened in tennis in the last few years is the emergence of a rating system called UTR, Universal Tennis Ratings, that's a lot like Fargo rating. Your rating is based upon your opponent's rating and the score, and everybody is coupled together in a big network. Before the ratings really got traction, the pros kind of made fun of it, and the developers claimed the U.S. Tennis Association tried to crush the effort. Then in a Moneyball-type moment, college recruiters began to realize looking up a recruit's UTR was better than watching them play. 
That's when the changes in tennis started happening more quickly. Then just last month, on December 7th, UTR, the rating effort, announced a three-year, $20 million worldwide tournament tour. The tour is aimed, globally, at players ranked between 200 and 2,000 in UTR rating. These are kind of the pro tennis players that work their butts off and sleep out of their car. So what about men and women at tennis? The highest UTR amongst women is that of Serena Williams. And there are 900 and something men in front of her. So the top woman in tennis barely tickles the top thousand. This means tennis and pool are really quite different. We probably shouldn't be surprised. If you can hit the ball even a few percent faster, your opponent has a few percent less time to get to the ball and respond. Golf is a similar sort of issue. If I'm a male pro who drives 300 yards, then in 10 drives I cover 3,000 yards. If we take those tee shots out of the equation, then I have effectively a 4,000 yard course that's par 62. A female trying to compete with me has maybe a 4,400 yard course with the same par. Some people see the fact that men dominate the high ranks of poker and chess as a meaningful thing. But they should look a little bit more closely. You think you know, but you don't know. Though Beth Harmon from Queen's Gambit is fictional, Susan Polgar from Budapest is not. Susan's a grandmaster. She's about 50 now and lives in St. Louis. But about this time at age 15, she was getting into a lot of what John Lewis would call good trouble in Hungary by refusing to play in women-only events. Fide ratings in chess are like a less sophisticated version of Fargo ratings. In the year following this photo, Fide added 100 points to all female players in the world, except for Susan. While Susan's 10-year-old sister Sophia made this trip to New York, her 7-year-old sister Judith didn't. Judith's interesting for a couple of reasons. She's 44 now and lives in Budapest. Bobby Fischer, a couple decades earlier, had the distinction of becoming the youngest grandmaster at age 15. And there's particular irony in this bit of karma that Judith was the one to end that distinction Bobby held for 23 years by becoming a grandmaster a month younger. 2700 is kind of the 800 Fargo rating of chess, and it seemed weird to people that this 2005 ranking list came out without Judith, who was 27-28, on it. Turns out she gave birth that year and wasn't sufficiently active, and that's fine. It would have felt more comfortable, though, had they applied the same standard to Bobby Fischer when he had periods of inactivity. The last time I played poker was at a beach vacation with this woman. Katie's my ex-daughter-in-law. She's also an ex-poker player. She doesn't play anymore, but she did it for a couple of years, and she was pretty good at it. She was ranked 78th, and she got this award for being the top female poker player, and it made her kind of uncomfortable. I talked about how I didn't think that this should be a thing, honestly, female player of the year. Oh, um, really? Why? Um, because I think it sort of sends the message that women are not expected to compete with men for there to be a separate category. Um, I was 78th in the overall player of the year race last year, and to get an award, it feels a little bit, a little bit silly. You know, like there are different expectations for men and women. So in thinking about this different expectations for men and women idea, uh, I want to go back to Kelly Fisher. Here's some information about Kelly's performance over the last decade or so. Each Hello Dot is a Fargo performance rating for 300 games in and around the date shown. First, we might surmise that in the decade before this chart, when Kelly tried and failed to get a men's snooker tour card, she was probably performing in the low 700s. Kelly improved steadily through 2013, then has a performance dip that's explained in the podcast, and then gets back up to 2013 shape and then some, and is now playing the best pool of her life. The two orange lines are the level of the top 100 players in Europe, and then the top 100 players worldwide. And the stars are ratings of the U.S. Moscone Cup team members. So back to Kelly on why there are more men than women at the highest levels of pool. I think, first of all, we've got to understand that the amount of men playing mm. compared to percentage of women playing. So th there's a lot more men players across the world. There's a lot more men playing snooker than women. There's a lot more men playing pool than women. So the percentages there kind of give you the odds of, of you know, the percentages of how many good players you're going to get out of a larger group than a smaller group. That's clear and consistent with the data. And probably not very different than the answer you would get if you asked, why are the more high-level Russian hockey players than Filipino hockey players? Or you might get the less polite response, huh? Why are you even asking? Doesn't everybody know they don't play hockey in the Philippines? There are, to be sure, biological differences between Russians and Filipinos. But it's unlikely anybody would be compelled to point out or examine or implicate those biological differences in answering this question. So let's go back to Kelly's response and see what happens 
right after she finishes the, the thought. So the percentages there kind of give you the odds of, of you know, the percentages of how many good players you're going to get out of a larger group than a smaller group. So, but After the but, Kelly goes on to explain that her coach looked into it. Women are better at multitasking. Men are better at concentrating and focusing on one thing at a time. And this is a contributing factor worth noting. And we hear similar things about men being more resistant to stress and having superior concentration in another excellent podcast, that of uh, Christina Tkach from Moscow. Many prominent players in the U.S. learned the hard way how strong Christina plays when she spent uh, a whole bunch of time in the U.S. last year. Here she weighs in on another aspect of fighting that expectation Katie talked about, that of getting comfort from it. If you come to play and you think it's okay for me to lose because I'm a girl, he's mad and he's better, blah, 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 then it's going to be helpless for your game. You have to come and you have to try your best and even more to beat him. And there, there can't be any uh, difference between you as a male and female. If you're not convinced that just how powerful expectations, both your own and, and those of others, can be, I think you'll be blown away by this. Goal bar in the middle is the overall chance of making it to the NHL, National Hockey League. The orange bar on the left and the green bar on the right are subgroups. One on the left has a way higher chance, and the one on the right has a way lower chance of making it to the NHL. Pretty big effect, so you might imagine these two groups differ by some biological thing like height. Uh, but they don't. They're biologically the same. Or you might imagine one group has families that value hockey more, or communities, or more money with more access to practice ice. Nope, those things are identical as well. Here's what's different. Orange bar is kids born in the first quarter of the year. Green bar is kids born in the last quarter of the year. Kids in the green bar were younger kids in a school grade. So maybe they didn't run as fast as third graders on the schoolyard. Maybe they decided for themselves they weren't as capable. Or their friends and families and communities decided they didn't have what it takes compared to the orange kids. And so maybe the orange kids got to push one another in the more elite programs and get the better coaches. We don't know. But it's clear that the social effects are already pretty big here. And in pool and poker and chess, they're a lot bigger. So back to pool. What do I mean when I say that Kelly's explanation that you expect to get fewer good players from a smaller pool of serious players is consistent with the data? Well, this means we're talking about the top 10,000 players in Fargo Raid. This means all players 570 and above. And this means the percentage of those that are female is 3.1, 314 out of 10,000 players. Before we go on, let's pretend we were talking about tennis and not pool. And the circle point was whatever point you have to go down to to get 3% of the tennis players being female. What would the tennis curve here look like? Well, we know when you get down to the top 1,000 players, this goes to zero. So we don't know the exact shape of the curve, but we know it needs to go from 3% down to zero, like this. And if we were talking about a running or jumping or throwing event, it would have to decay more quickly, because we, we know that there's no female in the top 5,000 performances for the 5,000 meter run, for instance. And if we had an activity that had just an ever so slight advantage of men over women, we would expect to see a slower decline. As you can see, there's no decline at all for pool. This is players 586 and above, 605, 629, 666, 700, and 730. Here's another statistical view. North America, US and Canada has 366 million people and 360 players over 700. That's about one per million. One per million is a good rule of thumb. Texas and California have 30 to 40 million people, and they have 30-something players over 700. Florida's in the 20s for both. Michigan's 10 million people and 11 players over 700. That makes this one interesting. Taiwan has 12 million women and 14 women over 700. Wouldn't happen for pole vault. So there's no more explanation required. There's no but needed. Sometimes we just can't seem to help throwing in that but, though. Isn't it true that there could be differences between men and women at any of these things other than strength and speed? And couldn't that make a difference? Well, sure, but for complex activities, these attributes are coupled. Here's an example. Um, body length, body mass, speed, strength, all matter for an American football running back. But you can have a top running back that's like a bulldozer, low to the ground, strong, massive, fast. You can have an equally good running back with smaller body mass and speed and agility. There's different ways to slice that bread. Is body length a biological characteristic that matters for pool? Of course it is. Ruthlin has overhead views of the pool table and 
ball patterns that Alex has no access to. Their hips bend at very different heights relative to the height of the pool table. There are shots Alex can't reach. If we already had it in our heads that Alex was a weaker pool player than Ruslan, we'd be all over these biological factors explaining it. But the fact is these are both world-class pool players, and we don't ask these questions or have these conversations. We recognize these are very subtle issues that can easily be overanalyzed. Another example to make the point is the triathlon that involves running, biking, and swimming. You can imagine an attribute like, say, how webbed are your fingers that impacts one of these but not the other two. More common, though, is something like upper body strength musculature that's a mixed bag. World-class triathletes have attributes that make them excel at one of these things without hurting the other two too badly. And there's just many ways to do this. Again, many ways to slice the bread. The social and cultural factors that make that top 10,000 Fergarator players 3% female and not 10% or 25% or 50% are huge. But again, I know Matt Truma uh, are doing some, like, they're opening their events to women. And I'll probably play in some. I probably will play in the US Open. So are we saying that there shouldn't be separate women's tours and major events? Yes, that's exactly what we're saying. We shouldn't do anything that's motivated by the notion that women are less capable at pool. Because that's just nonsense. There's no evidence for it. A separate question is whether it's reasonable to fund top women. Yes, Metro, CSI, open up your checkbooks, bring top women to your events. Predator, Kamui, etc., sponsor top women. Have special challenge or exhibition matches for top women who show up to flagship events. But do it because people are interested and women are a ridiculously underrepresented group in pool, not because women are not expected to compete. In summary, we find no evidence for and no reason to invoke a biological difference between men and women at pool.